Uh, my name is Samantha Ostrowski and I'm an environmental studies major. My senior thesis is called Cooperation, Contestation and Conservation, an Analysis of Peace Parks, which are transboundary protected areas. They're international nature preserves um, that can happen on between the boundaries of two different countries, of three different countries, an ecosystem that crosses a political boundary, and the idea is to take down fences and uh, boundaries between the two countries and create um, a larger protected area, a preserve that goes and encompasses more of the actual ecosystem. So my focus was on the role of cooperation because you have different, different nations, different units working on this, you have to have a certain amount of cooperation between them. So I wanted to see how that extra facet changed conservation, especially in relationship to transboundary or protected areas that are not transboundary. And so the statement I was working with was, the relationships and forms of cooperation among actors involved or potentially involved in peace parks greatly affects the establishment and quality of transboundary conservation. This result indicates the importance of cooperation among actors at different levels and among the various goals of peace parks, including ecological, social, economic, and political motivations. The first peace park actually in the world was Waterton Glacier International Peace Park, which is on the US-Canada border. If you've heard of Glacier National Park, it's actually part of Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. Um, I've also looked at the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park, which is in South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. If you've heard of Kruger National Park, which is a pretty, it's a pretty well-known park in South Africa. It's part of the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park. I'm also looking at a case in Uganda, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you've heard of mountain gorillas, this is where they are, the last ones. There's about 300 or so left. Um, and I'm also looking at the U.S.-Mexico border, which is, there's no specific peace park. It's a little bit more complicated. You hear the, the word peace park, and you hear the word transboundary protected area, and you think, okay, so we must be creating this space that is, it is peaceful, is open. It's a joint park. But it's actually, there's much more separation between the units than I expected. They're kind of proposed as this way to reduce conflict between nations. So the idea is that by cooperating through conservation, it creates an inroad for f further political cooperation between the nations. Areas like between India and Pakistan, that's another place where, yeah, a peace park would be great. It's a way to help resolve border conflict. It's a way to move troops out of the border. But it's more, it's not as easy as you might hope it would be. Um, another great example of that is North Korea, South Korea. The demilitarized zone, the DMZ, is actually a de facto nature preserve because people aren't really allowed there. It has become a park. And it is an international park because it's between these two countries. So I looked at cooperation both in terms of how different actors, how different nations interact and work together to create this space of conservation, but also how those political interests influence the ecological, how also social interests might influence the ecological. So trying to see, take a more holistic view of what actually is happening? How do we get conservation here? How is it contested? How is it actually played out? In my sophomore year, I'd taken um, African environmental history with Professor Jill Payne, and we had to write a final research project for it. And I happened to find this, just stumbled upon this conceptual plan for the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park. And I just started looking at it and started analyzing the language and what they were saying and how it was different from conservation projects that had gone on before, sort of pre-colonial versus post-colonial. And so I'd written it for that. I took another environmental history course of Latin America with Professor Rick Lopez and had 
kind of come back to that same topic again a year later. I found another book that I wrote on for my final project. And so when senior year came around, I figured I'd already done a little bit of work on this. It seemed to be something that was interesting to me. So I decided to just keep going with it. This has been a really important part of my experience here. It's something I've wanted to do since my first day here, um, to take on a project like this, an independent project. And to have completed that it really feels good. Whether or not I end up you know, publishing parts of it or taking on this work in graduate school, it's something that I'm proud of and I think will form a really crucial part of my memories of being here.